Good morning, I'm Roger Sutton, Editor-in-Chief of The Hornbook, and I am here today with three of our Boston Globe Hornbook honorees. We have Elizabeth Acevedo, author of The Poet X. We have Celia Perez, author of The First Rule of Punk. And we have Varian Johnson, author of The Parker Inheritance. <laughs> And we're just going to talk for a few minutes. I have one question for them. Maybe other questions will come up. We shall see. But, you know, all of us in this culture anyway, we read, we listen to music, maybe we draw pictures, we certainly look at pictures. But you three are creating lives devoted to making art of one kind or another, or maybe of both kinds. That's in your book, you've drawn these kind of words. And what I'm curious about is, was there a moment when you realized that you could build your life around creating art? I, I'll start first. I'll start first. <laughs> I, I, I think, yes, but I think it's, it's always a question of what that life looks mm -hmm. like. I think um, all of us are creative, and yeah. um, it's certainly very um, fortunate to be in publishing um, but even if we weren't publishing books, we would probably be, have some type of creative thing in our lives. We're just fortunate enough for it to be publishing books. If I wasn't publishing, I would still be writing, telling stories in some type of way. We're all storytellers at our heart, I would guess. Um, I guess for me, though, I did think as I, you know, my, my first career was a civil engineer. I designed bridges, and um, I loved it. But I also knew that while it, fulfilled by bank account and financial needs. Um, it wasn't quite filling, fulfilling the creativity. Were you creativity. writing at the same time? I was writing at the same time. I did both um, for the same time for a long time, and um, I was fortunate books began to do uh, better and better, and I was able to walk away from that job to do this full time. But even when I was doing it while I was doing my engineering job, I still had a creative life. It just wasn't wholly immersed in books. Was that a scary jump to make? Um, no, it wasn't a scary jump to make. I think, um, if anything, I was maybe a little too cautious with it. I think I could have jumped sooner, and I think fear, um, and the fear of disappointing others maybe, maybe held me back longer than, than I should have been held back. Celia? Um, well, writing for me is still my side hustle because I'm a librarian full time. <laughs> so um, so it's you know it's it's definitely a privilege to be able to to write and uh, for publication. Um, I think when I think back to like my creative life and where I got the sense of um, I guess maybe agency in creating, um, I kind of go back to when I got into punk and um, seeing other people creating uh, you know, making you know, making music, making albums, putting out zines, um, making art uh, in a way that was um, very like self-directed and not um, at the at the mercy of um, some like higher power that gave you the permission to create or to put this thing out into the world. So, um, so I think that getting into punk and then getting into making zines was where I first felt like. Um, like I had a, uh, a a direction and a way to an outlet to to get out my writing and my creativity and um, and then maybe eventually do something else with it um, that was not you know just my little self published magazines. So how did you, as a librarian, I see you even have a bun to. Dude, that's <laughs> my, my signature bun. Because <laughs> punk is that's my generation, right? Um, I think you know the I. Sex Pistols and all. Yeah. How did you, I mean. Where did you come into it? Huh? Well, punk is, you know, punk's been around. I think, I think punk is going. a philosophy. In, you know, on the one hand, it's this, this idea of, you know, um, creating without, you know, looking for permission from the establishment, in, in a sense. But um, musically, yeah, so 70s was kind of the beginning. But um, oh, you were what, four? I got, who knew? <laughs> I mean, I was, that was, that's my picture, but I was a four-year-old punk. <laughs> um, I 
became interested in it um, when I was in college, and it was the first time I was away from home, and I, you know, I was introduced to these people who were just making things without permission, and to me, it was just such a mind-blowing concept because uh, growing up with immigrant parents, I felt like. <laughs> everything I did had to, Elizabeth's laughing because you probably know, everything I did, you know, I had, I had to ask for permission. I had to be granted um, permission by somebody else who had more power than I did. Mm -hmm. And um, so for me, punk first became, uh, as far as an interest, first it was a musical thing because I uh, was going to college in Gainesville, Florida, which is a small college town. And like a lot of small college towns, it has um, a burgeoning, like a really huge music scene. Um, and punk was very central to it. Um, so I became interested in it that way, just listening to local bands. Um, but um, and then through that interest, kind of reaching back into into the history of punk and listening to you know Sex Pistols and the Clash and the Ramones. Because I remember it was my junior year of college, and somebody brought in a copy of Patti Smith's Horses. Mm -hmm. We'd never heard anything like it. Before, yeah, so. and it's yeah, and there are bands and musicians who. Um, I think maybe are not labeled or thought of as punk, but are are creators who sort of set the path for what you know what later became labeled punk. So what does it mean then to have this anti-establishment create your own art ethos in a trade book for children? <laughs> I know that's always a yeah that's a clash. That's always a funny. Uh, thought that you know might be published. <laughs> 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 It's, yeah, it, it's, um, I just thought, I wanted to write a story about, about someone who's looking for a way to express herself and to, and to, you know, find her voice and get it out into the world. Um, and I think for me personally, a big part of that was getting into punk, and so that's how it became part of this story. And it is a little bit of a clash, but I like to think of, of this book as introducing kids to, um, not just, you know, punk music, but the idea of creating and not waiting for someone to, mm -hmm. to give you the okay to create. Um, and the idea that art is something that is, you know, it's everywhere around us and everyone has the power to create. It's not something that you only see in museums or you only see in libraries or, um, or in record stores. Um, everyone has, you know, if you've got the desire, you can, you can create it. So, um, so I'm hoping it's, uh, it, it's, you know, it gives kids maybe a little bit of a uh, sense of, you know, we don't have to wait for Viking to publish our book. <laughs> and, and I always say if, if Viking had published this, it would have just been one very long zine. So. <laughs> but Elizabeth, you have sort of the same deal going, don't you? Coming from spoken word poetry, which I guess I think of, it's not punk, but it's that same kind of self-starting. Yeah. Anyone can be right. a poet if you have the bravery to stand up. Right. And, your thing so right I mean I was, I was sitting here kind of thinking about I've been writing since I was I mean really young but I started performing when I was 12 and at 14 I started competing so I would you know compete at poetry slams I knew early on that I loved being on stage and I loved performing my own work and I went to college and created my own major in performing arts like I knew it to that extent of this is what I want to do um, and devoted myself to learning this craft and I think realized at some point that if my body wasn't in the room, my work wasn't there either. And there's something fascinating about being able to carry all of your stories and that that's the only way people have access. But I think it started feeling a little limiting. Um, what happens to the stories that can't be told in a three minute poem? What happens to the stories that can't be told in a one hour show? Um, and for me, the idea of a book I think because of my background, I, I was just really nervous. Like, I, I mean, I can't write a book. That's for someone else. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think I come from performers. That makes sense. But the literary world didn't feel like it was it was somewhere I could walk into. And it took a long time for me to be brave enough to say, um, why not me? And why not you know my stories in in this space as well? Can I ask you guys? Sorry. No, you go ahead. I'm just really curious. All right. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, because you know spoken word and zines like those are you're creating them they're your own you can do kind of whatever you want do you find the shift to traditional publishing hard when you've now got other people um working along with you you know yes that. yeah um it was a, for me it was um it was a little bit of a challenge especially with the zines part of the book because when i make zines 
um, for myself just to give out to friends. I There's not a whole lot of an editorial process that goes into it. I mean, I sort of have an idea of what I'm going to include in one um, and what I want it to look like, and then I just create it. Um, but with these, they did go through an editorial process, which was a total <laughs> very unzine. Um, so there, yeah, there definitely was, there, there is, but I think that, um, that probably, I mean, that happens, I'm sure, with, like, sure. in your book, I mean, with anything, with a story, yes. with, uh, with illustrations, yeah. everyone's gonna, you create for yourself, but then when it's, you know, if there's a publisher involved, you're mm -hmm. gonna have to, yeah. you're not just creating for yourself, sure. you're creating for an audience. Yeah. How do you and, feel, if you feel, I guess I shouldn't print this question from the start, but how has working with editors changed your sense of yourself as an artist? Has it made you a better artist? Has it, have you put limits on you? Have you learned things from your editors that have changed the way you work? I mean, I think going to like both of the questions, you know, po poetry that is performed is incredibly collaborative. Mm -hmm. um, particularly if you do slams that are team slams, sure. because then you're writing poems with a group and you're editing them with the group and you have other people relying on you. So I think I learned early on, how do you um, get your own words into a piece and also listen to feedback? And that's, you know, that's what an MFA is also, is like listening to that feedback and taking what you will and what you won't. I think I've been given a really long leash at Harper and they're kind of like, well, let's see how these stories might translate and, and I, I get very little feedback on language. Um, and not because my editor isn't, critical of the language, but because I think she's aware of, well, well, let's see what's happening here. Let's see what Liz will do if we just let her kind of cook. Yeah. Um, and then she'll come in and like, you know, catch you, and she's like, you've said this 10 times. Like, what, what are you doing here? Like, this doesn't feel as intentional as I think you mean it to be. Um, I don't feel like I'm, I'm, I'm kind of caged in though. I think it feels very much like I have someone who can catch the things I can't see, who has a bigger scope when I'm way too close to the work and can just call out things that I almost all the time I'm like, oh, yep, yep, like that yeah. feels true. Yeah. And when things don't feel true, I can kind of say, well, here's what I'm thinking here, and I, I feel like this is a necessary line to keep. Mm -hmm. And I very rarely get pushback when it's very clear, like, no, I, we have to keep this. Um, and I'm also really good at, like, if something doesn't resonate, let's get it out of there. Like, if, and maybe that's just the brevity of poetry. You're used to getting rid of a lot of things, and so, my editor says like this just I don't think it's hitting the way you think it is like all right let's mm -hmm. yeah let's get out well thank you all for being here thank you for talking about your process thank you to the Center for the Study of Children's Literature for hosting us in their new suite thank you Cassie for being our videographer happy to and I hope we all see you again at one of these events very soon thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.